We're talking today, right. uh, Drive, a film yeah. directed by Nicholas Winding Refn. Right. Uh, Good to point it out first because there's another Drive starring Sylvester Stallone. So yeah, there's a lot of one. drives, a lot of drivers, a lot of drivens. Like a driven, <laughs> right, yeah. But fun fact, Refn doesn't have his driver's license. No, and he I think failed the writer, it. too. He failed it eight times. Eight times. Well, nine's too many. Yeah, at that point, you really just shouldn't even be trying anymore. You can just right. direct other people to drive, like exactly. we're doing today. Yeah. <laughs> today, we're talking Drive. Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from GoatFilmReviews.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for finding us. Thanks for watching. And once again, thank you for supporting the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. We do have a Patreon. Check that out for some great deals. Both Kyle and I are members of the Middle Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Hard to get out sometimes. <laughs> uh, so check out the websites for critics reviews as well as ours. Today, we're going to talk about what many regard as Rens, uh, Rens, right. Refn. Refn. Masterpiece, it's drive. Yeah, so a Hollywood stuntman and getaway driver knows how to handle himself around mm -hmm. cars, and he never gets too close to the people around him. All that changes when he meets his neighbor, Irene. In an effort to help her, he agrees to drive for her husband's next robbery, and all hell breaks loose. Okay, so it's interesting to note that this was submitted into, I believe, the Toronto film, no, Con? I think it was Toronto, wasn't it? Was it Con? Yeah. Or Con. It was Toronto... Yes, the Toronto uh, Ren would uh, win Best Director at 2011 Cannes mm. Film Festival, so he won Best Director for mm. this, while shopping for distribution for it. Mm. So uh, that's a good shopping mark. Yeah, I think the salesman it's pretty easy to sell a movie when you win Best Director for the. the it's not a bad way to go. <laughs> no, right. So it's an easy way. If you win Best Director at a film festival and you're looking for distribution. It's a good card to have. Mm -hmm. So, Drive. I think this is the first time you've seen it. We'll yes, get it is. to your room in a minute. But overall, uh, a lot of people regard this as a masterpiece. It has one of the best intros, I would think, ever on film. A lot of people would say, what's your best intro? They'll list that as one of the top tens. Mm. It has one of those uncut, very little dialogue intros that kind of retains the movie. Yeah, it does. It, it begins, I mean, we, we like to talk about movies yeah. that begin with a big splash. You know, that have yeah. a big opening moment in media res. This one has that. We get to, and the nice thing too is when you have a film called Drive, <laughs> it should start with right. some driving sequence. Like you shouldn't be introduced to it. Uh, what a lot of people looked at this film and got frustrated about was that the marketing sold this film as a Fast and the Furious style action. It did. It did. Um, it did. In fact, one woman actually sued the studio for selling her an incorrect movie. <laughs> so clickbait, you can actually clickbait see, yeah, clickbait of it basically. Yeah. You know, this guy gets behind the wheel of a car. You'll never guess what happens next. Um, so we begin with a big scene, and then kind of like Thief, we begin with a big scene. Right. We give ourselves some, some character development, and we we don't feel like it's wasted time, but it's there. Right. Especially when you write. Especially when you're doing writing, you want to know. And I I always ask this with a lot of people's scripts. The character has to want something right now, and you get that right away. He picks out the car, and he's doing the job. He doesn't. There's not a lot of exposition, not a lot of world building, but you understand the pacing, the concept right away. Without any, like, oh yeah, he's a driver for bad guys. Does he know him personally? Doesn't look like he knows him personally. How did he get in contact? So you're going through the whole process as the events unfolding. Then you realize how skillful he is, mm -hmm. and then you have explained just without even talking. You explain his talents right away. See, and that's that's what you see at the beginning right there. Is it's an interesting way to start a film because it's not really giving you answers. We like right. to get films that start off and start giving right. us little nuggets of information about our characters. Really, the information we're given here: he's a driver, a getaway driver. He's yeah. pretty good at what he's doing, clearly. But we actually get more questions than answers in I the get, first scene, yeah. and I think that's an interesting way to begin. Uh, this film definitely has its DNA and fingerprints all over from the inspirations like Bullet. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely like inspirations from Michael Mann. You have this very glossy aesthetic to it. I think obviously you got inspiration for Heath, uh, Thief or something like oh, that. Yeah. Or very much like Heat as well. Mm -hmm. So you have this very glossy, I wouldn't say semi-gloss, but it makes LA look a lot more better than it really is. We've been in LA before. It, yeah, it's it almost, kind of feels like how Reservoir Dogs elevates its you know, main characters. That they're the yeah. coolest people in the room even though in reality, they might not be. Yes. Uh, that scene elevates LA, it elevates our driver. We don't get a name that makes him more mysterious, very man with no name Clint Eastwood-esque. Okay, exactly. Um, yeah, the world does feel like a Michael Mann. The world feels a little bit like Walter Hill from 48 Hours. Um, yes, good call. see those elements at yeah. play there where we're building kind of a universe of our own, kind of a, 
I think uh, Refn had referred to it as a fairy tale. Yes. yes. So it's interesting. Uh, this is an interesting development. If you through your research, I hope you caught mine. How this movie got made intentionally. Um, Rem. Refn. Refn. <laughs> you'll catch me then. <laughs> no, was coming to Hollywood to direct a movie starring Harrison Ford, where mm -hmm. Harrison Ford were going to be murdered. Mm -hmm. And then through certain transactions, he just met Ryan Gosling being sick, and he said, "Ryan, could you just ride me, drive me to the store?" Mm. And he had a meltdown. Have you shared the story before you heard it? I've heard bits and pieces, yeah. And then it just had uh, emotions of leaving family. He just became a dad, that he's sick, and then all this poured out of him as Ryan Gosling's <laughs> playing, you know, driving. And then they said to himself, maybe this should be the movie that we do. Mm. And so it's kind of weird that he abandoned that project with Harrison Ford to start development for Drive. Initially, Drive already had somebody attached to it, Neil Marshall and Hugh Jackman. Yeah. Um, that wasn't going on nowhere. It was kind of spinning its wheels with no traction. But when Ryan Gosling said he's interested and he knew a director he wanted to work with, this became the movie result. Yeah, I think it was kind of a thing where, yeah, the, the idea for a driver, like, was really as far as I think Refn had gotten in terms of, like, crafting yeah. any character. And this thing kind of happened to be something that Gosling became aware of later on and then was, like, retroactively, I got a guy for that. It is funny. I would like to have seen that Neil Marshall, Hugh Jackman film as well. Interesting. Um, if they do a remake, can you call him? Right. Yeah. He's, he does excellent horror movies. Like, a Descent is one of my well, favorite horror Neil movies. Marshall is also a filmmaker who gets incredibly graphic. And there are graphic moments in Drive, but it doesn't yeah. feel like it would be a Neil, Neil Marshall screenplay yeah. uh, in that way. So I would be curious to see how Hugh Jackman and he would have teamed on it. <laughs> if you're going to be interested in uh, film and filmmaking, I love when film is also a film about another film mm -hmm. so you have this he's a stunt for another film but you have a lot of the downtime shot into it you know sign your liability if you get your head cut off it's not yeah. our fault <laughs> it's you drive some skills but the action pace of how you shoot that the crane shots and everything mm -hmm. not to mention the point of view that we're saying is the real film but you see how the, all the layout for one little crash how yeah. it takes events I appreciate that Refn directs the movie within the movie differently than he directs the movie itself yeah. that's a subtle nod for him uh, and it's it's curious. I mean, in Hollywood, we love movies about movies. <laughs> so I know. Even well, if we could have a subtle moment of it, we're going to put it in there. <laughs> uh, people who love books like to write about authors struggling. Shining is yeah. a perfect example. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, the, it's actually, you know, for all the – how it came about, the Hollywood end is actually based on a book, a real book. Yep. By James Salis. Now, he's also known as writing noirs. He wrote uh, the Lou Griffin Detective Series from the 90s. He's based in L Louisiana. I don't know, it's still stuck as well making a movie based on those stories, mm -hmm. which is really weird because this is completely different from James Salas doing. It's almost like Emma Letter did a lot of westerns in the 50s and 60s, and then he started doing crime stories where he got no writing. Mm -hmm. This is James kind of at the end of his career writing this book that doesn't really – not true adapt adaptation from the book from what I hear. It's a lot of flow of consciousness kind of thing backstories it's not as as happening so they had a ch lot of changes for the adaptation yeah Hossein Amini who had written the screenplay for it said the film had a non-linear dreamlike tone poem quality like he used mm. all those words it was like cosmic gumbo all in there <laughs> um, a 2005 yeah. novel that uh, producers Mark Platt and Adam Siegel had optioned and they actually optioned it because they read a positive review in Publishers Weekly so if you hate critics Sometimes you get a good movie out of a, a good book. Sometimes it looks yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I'm, yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Hussein's also, I uh, think, check out Wings of a Dove. Mm. If I'm right, it's one of those who got nominated for a Screenwriting Hall of Fame. It's one oh, of those okay. adaptations. It's a good person to recruit for adaptation that you're not going to directly lift from the book. You're going to find some ways to you can narrate. Because the beginning of this movie shows you how it's not a lot of dialogue for yeah. a movie, right? It does feel tone poemish throughout the entire film. <laughs> right. yeah. um, and if you like uh, Amini's writing, actually, and you like Elmore Leonard, he actually did an adaptation of an Elmore Le Leonard book with Killshot uh, featuring Mickey Rourke. He wrote the screenplay for that. So Good call. Got a right. inside information. <laughs> um, interesting tidbit. This film is dedicated to filmmaker Alejandro Dodorowsky. He's an oh, avant-garde nice. filmmaker from, a, oh, is it Argentina? I think it's Argentina. I don't want to say Argentina. Forgive us if we're wrong. But we're Give wrong, but he's done uh, movies like The Holy Mountain and The Rainbow Thief. He's one of my choices to research for film class, and I picked somebody else. But um, it's weird that he chose Alejandro um, Dodorowsky from uh, Argentina as dedicating this film to but it is the certain elements of our regard for this movie. There. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen El Topo, Santa Sangra, um, and I've seen the documentary Yodorovsky's Dune, which was a really cool documentary covering his 
uh, failed adaptation of Dune before David Lynch took over. Yeah. Uh, Yadorovsky has a, a lot of, like again, like characters that were not given names who are main characters. Some of his Western films are very dreamlike and less based in the reality or based in the right. traditional spaghetti Western. So you do kind of get some elements that are at play with the driver, with the, yeah. the lone gunman, if you will, the guy that's in there kind of out for himself, smart enough to know not to get in with a crew uh, until he's forced to. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what? What do you overall? This is. Your, I want you to go first because it's the first time seeing it. Obviously, you are aware of this movie. Yes. Everybody kind of talks about it. It's kind of weird that we critiqued Neon Demon before this because everybody knew <laughs> he had Drive before Neon Demon, and you kind of did the flip end. Yeah. Uh, so, so Drive is one that's been sitting on my shelf since probably 2013. I haven't watched it. So right. like many of my movies, you need a reason um, to watch. It. Yeah. So Drive is one for me where I'd seen Neon Demon. It's the only other Refn film that I have seen. Ref um, and I Get thought to myself, Neon Demon is the kind of movie that I think it's really gorgeous looking but it kind of loses its substance in trying to be over metaphorical I think that's what he's trying to go for it's all gloss and aesthetic no substance behind it yeah whereas Drive I think this is going to go back to what I say about a lot of filmmakers and sometimes you're a great director who needs someone else to craft that screenplay because I look at the comparison I have between Drive and that film I think Drive is brilliant I think oh, yeah. it is a master class in in not speaking, lacking dialogue. They chopped the dialogue out of this movie for his character and Carrie Mulligan's character, yeah. um, which actually forced them to add a little bit more to Brian Cranston to kind of keep keep developing characters. So that's why his character Shannon, not in the screenplay, but in actuality, just keeps rambling. Brian Cranston's improv. role, right. Yeah, yeah. so I Brian that, Cranston adds a lot to that. As the crusty, out. almost crusty Obi-Wan Kenobi yeah. cut to him. But I like the crane shot of look at all the car options and he picks the one that I would not choose which mm -hmm. is the perfect reason why you choose because you choose when it, you're yeah. in trouble uh, you have to choose that one uh, definitely a lot of the aesthetics like I said if you love Michael Mann if you love like Peter Yates what they've done before um, he's definitely lifted a lot of stuff and then the DNA is mixed in it um, it's very much a fairy tale yes. it's almost a fairy tale-esque you won't it's very subtly played but it's that very fairy tale grim story of knight shining armor rescuing a girl because I always forget Oscar Isaac is in this movie. Yes. Well, yeah, when I saw his name in the credits, I was like, wait, he's in? Like, okay, like, I'll wait, I'll wait until it's there. Yeah. Um, great cast for one thing, but I also say yeah. uh, it comes down to, I would say take it even to, from the level of fairy tale to fable, and specifically the scorpion and the frog, which is referenced mul multiple times throughout the film and just Clever. quick references, as well as other things. Ryan Gosling's character, the driver, is the frog. And if you don't know the fable, it's that the scorpion asks the frog for a ride across, I think it's a river, and he goes, well, you're not going to sting me, are you? And he goes, of course not. He gets the scorpion on his back, starts going across. The scorpion stings him. As they're both sinking into the ground, or sinking into the water, yeah. about to die, he says, why'd you do that? And he says, it's in my nature. So in certain ways, in our nature is a way of unchanging uh, the, right. the question of, you know, are we able to beat our nature? And in a lot of ways, it's interesting that Ryan Gosling's character as the frog is wearing a scorpion on his back. So yes. he is actually carrying the scorpion. He's carrying the thing that will kill him, perhaps. But, uh, yes, and that understandably, visually, metaphor. It's not explained to you vocally. Nobody has to tell you, but you understand it if you do a little more research. That's what it makes a masterpiece. You want a little bit to know about it and go to a little bit yes. investigation. That's one of the interesting things about this movie is, like, I want to know more and more. Sometimes it's not really there, but it's that's what enticement. See, and I look yeah. at films like that way where it's, it's got to work on its own as a story. To me yeah. personally, I'm a writer, so I'm more always focused on story. And it that, has to work as a story. And it has that pacing, mm -hmm. that music perfect music selection yep. for what you want to display. Yeah, I yeah. love this. The, 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 it's funny, the music isn't 80s, but it feels yeah. like the 80s. Oh, oh, oh. It was all written yeah. in like the you know mid to late aughts. It feels, <laughs> so. This movie feels like it's like 1988. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And part of that comes from this uh, Cliff Martinez, who did the music, who also did the Neon Demon, he did Traffic, uh, took over for another musician that was hired on to kind of craft the score. Got it. And it yeah. kind of molded this weird... I, I very much see a lot of thief in the score. I see a lot of... Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of what Michael Mann had been doing. That's where I see the most of Michael Mann. Because, like, I, re I referenced Hill. Hill gets a little bit of, like, that city gritty. Yes. You know, the, the yes, copiness, the fightingness of it all. But this is really a Michael Mann homage. A lot of Reffin's style seems to come from Mann. Uh, interesting tip it is uh, a lot of the acting for all the people, even Ron Perlman's in it, Brian Cranston's in it, but actually Albert Brooks has is, is got the most recognition. I think he was even a nominated for a supporting role in this film, if I want to double check my uh, notes. The film got sound yeah. editing nominations. Sound editing. He was, he was being talked about, and I actually, I thought he was too. I looked it up and then I found yeah. out, no, he wasn't apparently. But. but it's that subtlety. We always talk about you know theater acting is you're driving a bus, uh, movie acting, you're driving a golf cart. Mm. Does it really <laughs> well. I mean, he doesn't have to say anything, but he had, brings that prominent force yes. to the scene that weight 
that I think a lot of, like, you can understand Gosling can flee, mm -hmm. right? But you understand if you're near books, it's almost like gravity. He's the gravity character. Sometimes you write gravity characters that everybody comes to. Yeah. Like, Whether uh, they want to or not. The Baron Harkonnen from Dune, he's mm -hmm. the gravity that everybody goes to, right? Uh, very centered. But this is almost like a comeback for Albert Brooks. He was kind of ne neglected or kind of going went away a little bit where we've seen a lot in the 80s and the 90s. Well, that's why yeah. the trouble when you look at a film like uh, even his voice work in Finding Nemo, people thought that was such a, uh, an interesting choice. To have yeah, to do a it was interesting. Finding Nemo Very because good. he was known for his comedies, the dramedy comedies in some yeah. level. A lot of films in the 80s and 90s that he did work on um, where you know he's, he's great at what he does, but he hadn't done a lot of biting, action-driven kind of stuff. So he chose this film to do something outside the box. I was blown away from by Albert Brooks. And, and some of the choices, I like that Reffin worked with his actors to craft these characters. Talk about um, it with him. So yeah. he allowed Albert Brooks to shave his eyebrows, to appear more emotionless. You know, when you look at the way Reffin... If you're uh, going to shave your eyebrows for a movie, you got to get nominated. you really got to do gotta something, because they might not something. come back, man. I've seen people where they don't come back. <laughs> right, yeah. um, when he hired Brian Cranston, Reffin knew that he was getting offers from Breaking Bad, like because of Breaking Bad, so he yeah. said, let's craft your character together. He knew, like, I've got to give him something to really pop and really stand out. Um, I like that he cast Christina Hendricks in a role. But he doesn't yeah. over sexualize her, which is essentially what a lot of you know directors had done with no, Christina even Hendricks she's for a long time. Has a she's great buttoned up the whole time. A few <laughs> minutes of her in Neon Demon as well. I mm -hmm. think he knows exactly when he she's on board with her project. He knows exactly how to what to do with her. Yeah. Yeah. And Carrie Mulligan, I know she's playing damsel in distress. That cliche, but it's almost she plays it with the sincerity that I I, I can handle myself almost. Mm. Like almost like she, like she's had to handle herself. Yes, I, th I see a lot of like yeah. she's had to deal with the fact that Oscar Isaac's been out of the picture, the fact that she's been single mothering it for a while, and that awkward engagement at the grocery store. Yeah, it's goodly shot. Yeah, it's greatly shot. Even a car. We know about car and how you film cars and everything exterior wise in L.A. It's a difficult thing to do. So we I marvel not only the production and the, how it came out, but how you make a film like that is very challenging as well, and mm -hmm. how you edit this film as well. Yeah, because you got a great shotgun blast of all time that you yeah. don't even know it's coming. Yeah, and in fact, you see uh, you see that the after effects of that shotgun blast in the makeup trailer when he steals the head later on. It's a little sub joke. He's got the actual like effects Clever. of it. Um, yeah, the film uh, edited by Tom or Matthew Newman, who did again Neon Demon recently, did the film Without Remorse, the Tom Clancy adaptation. Yeah. Um, that's it's a tough thing to do if you don't have dialogue to drive the narrative because you have to decide long spaces of time without dialogue how much time do you spend because oftentimes when do you cut a scene when the last guy's done speaking uh to, to craft a film when no yeah. one's speaking for large stretches is very very tough to or do. to write that and somebody take that serious like you're missing something here yeah no, that's the end of the scene no you're missing something you need to write something like a dialogue i've cut people like that no i'm comfortable just fade to black right there mm -hmm. yeah. yeah even recent recent uh television work like the I've heard a lot of criticisms in the new Lord of the Rings series is that they don't know when to cut the scene at the end that the scene gets done with the meat of it and then they keep talking for another couple moments yeah. so like it's, it shows that even with dialogue you can mess up the edit you can kind of overdo it in one way so having Matthew Newman actually know when to cut the film having this come in under two hours because you could feel over indulgent if you wanted but I like that the film runs pretty quick and that first 50 minutes it's almost like the be that's the whole beginning of the movie and you're like I want to know more mm -hmm. which is fascinating because we're just already 15 minutes in we're like I don't feel like we've already started yet what? Yeah. yeah we haven't really had yeah. time to, to mold yeah. with it yet so I I have to look back. I don't think it was my top ten of the decade at the St. Paul Film Cast. I'm watching this and I'm trying to like, why? Mm. I mean, why did I miss that? I don't know what because I. It's one of those maybe it's just I too much of a fairy tale for me. Mm, I don't okay. know. Or it's, it's not really what it sells it to be. You think it's a car chase movie? You think it's Fast and Furious? Fast and Furious. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you think it's like a Michael Mann movie? But there's obviously not so much a Michael Mann, but there's a fairy tale element to this. It's a fable to to this. Mm. So it's a lot of things that you, when you go into it, you're going to see. But really, that's it. It's a damsel in distress kind of movie. In Ryan's kind of an introverted person, which fits yeah. perfect for him. It's, he probably got the role for Blade Runner doing this movie. He probably got that role of the, the emo Blade emotionless, right, yeah. voiceless kind of a character. Um, you know, I I think the one of the reasons that it doesn't sit as high for me on right. my list. I mean, we're, we're talking top ten films of an entire De decade. decade so, right, yeah. Let's be you real got, here. You thousands. can still be very, very good and miss that list. It probably, um, probably would, huh? But uh, the thing that rings true for me is, is that I find, again, that, like, Refn tends to have these gorgeously styled films. 
But the film is a little paint by numbers in some way. It doesn't feel as surprising. Even having someone like Albert Brooks, you know from the moment he shows up because the performance is so good, you know that he's going to switch on that evil track really yeah. easily. You know, all the characters outside of him seem to play into those roles. Yes. And you have to remember, too, even Oscar Isaac, who we see him now as like, he's Moon Knight. He's, you know, our character from Star Wars. He's always playing a good guy. At that point in his career, you know, he'd come off things like Sucker Punch, where he played this, like, you know, a slimy, him. smarmy guy. Yeah. You know, he played some some, some not-so-reputable characters, and so he's here again playing a not-so-reputable character. People kind of play in their types, and I think that's where you kind of lose a little bit of the storytelling substance of it all. Yes. Um, whereas we don't have as many scenes because the driver doesn't talk. We don't have the scenes like Thief has with that really long, I think it's like a 16-minute diner scene. That is, your entire story is happening yeah, in Thief. Without any camera minutes. movement. You almost just set yeah. the camera down on you guys. Go. He went and got a cheeseburger and came back, pretty, you know? Much, whereas this yeah. film, again, due to the very fact that our character doesn't have a name, doesn't seem to have a thick personality, does kind of lose itself substance-wise. I don't think that's an entire fault of the film, but it doesn't have that sticking power outside of the style. I agree. It's almost, uh, and this is weird because we sometimes don't agree that Ryan's character gets lost into the whole picture of the movie. He doesn't emerge out of it. Mm. I think that's what he's surrounded by characters that are more colorful than him. Yeah, you know, and I think that's the element you need somebody popping out of your movie, like Indiana Jones. Mm. He is almost he's outside the movie. He's outside the story. Everybody yeah. go around him, where it feels like Ryan Ryan is almost still camouflaged into the whole aesthetic of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, have you seen? Drive. Yeah, let us know your thoughts on the film down below. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, give us give us your favorite Nicholas Winning reference film. It's probably Drive. A lot of people seem to love that, but he's yeah. made a, quite a few films that don't get talked about either. So let us know which one we should be talking about next down in the comments. Yeah, he um, did the Push. Uh, push The whole trilogy, I think. Push a trilogy. Uh, the, yeah. the film Bronson, which a lot of people talk about the lead performance, but don't really talk Fantastic about the director. I didn't realize well. he directed that. So. I, didn't know, I didn't remember because I just remember Tom Hardy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let us know your thoughts on the film down below and Refn as a director. Please make yes. sure you like and subscribe. There are two free things that you can do that make sure that you never miss an episode of the show and they help support us at the same time. Yes. We appreciate that. Check yeah. out that Patreon link down below as well. You can get exclusive perks like Picks with Kyle and Nick, our mm -hmm. show The Road to De Palma, uh, where we do Brian De Palma picks exclusively for our patrons. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for joining us so very much. And you can find all my film reviews over at GoatFilmReviews.com. You can find my show the St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere you find podcasts, and I can drive a stick. Can you? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs>